or Tibet remained independent. It was a sovereign country. Sovereignty or protectorate, yes, of China, but it was never a part of China. Chinese in any case have not honored their agreement. Like I said, the Mao statement is that every agreement is just a just a way to buy time. Their ultimate aim is the national interest which they want to achieve. Pen pass sharing is the new elected uh, Sikyong of uh, Central uh, Tibet Administration. In fact, he gave a very interesting statement, which I think somewhere tells you the psyche of people living in that region, which is China and Tibet. What he said is, time is no constraint. We will wait. Because what goes up comes down. <laughs> so if China is rising, fine. But China will also see its downfall. Whether it was in Galban or whether it was in uh, uh, Doklam or any other place where we have come into confrontation. There have been a number of confrontations, let me tell you. It's not only just these two. There have been virtual combat fights hand to hand almost every month in the eastern sector. They started going after every Tibetan who had some, any kind of a Buddhist uh, uh, insignia with him. Even a photo of Dalai Lama uh, invited uh, death by the uh, armed Chinese soldiers. Despite the fact that what Dalai Lama's position is and what the Sikyong of uh, the Central Administration of Tibet is doing, we can find resources which can be inducted into Tibet. Jai Hind and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achind. Today is a special subject, India's Tibet card. We hear this a lot nowadays, especially after the Chinese aggression in Ladakh and of course the Doklam standoff in 2017. I must say before I begin this subject, it is not right that we bring up this particular subject every time the Chinese do get aggressive. These are India's options around its own neighborhood and Tibet is one of the biggest ones that we need to keep in mind. To discuss this, I have with me Lieutenant General Dushyan Singh, PVSM, AVSM. He was commissioned into the 9th Battalion of the Maratha Light Infantry in December 1981, served in various terrains and theatres of operations across the country, and as well as a UN military observer. He also holds the distinction of having served twice in the National Security Guard once as the Deputy Inspector General, second time as the Inspector General. He's also held the appointment of Brigadier General of a Corps in the East, Chief of Staff of the Eastern Command, commanded a Corps, and thereafter retired as the Commandant of the Army War College. Thank you, sir, for joining me on this particularly important subject. Morning, Hadi, and thank you very much for inviting me once again to your platform. Sir, this particular topic of Tibet has obviously, I mean, we uh, when we go around, especially northern parts of our country, we have Tibetan settlements. We also have Tibetan settlements in a couple of uh, southern, uh, you know, uh, areas uh, of Karnataka as well as, uh, you know, various other places. The only time when India starts discussing Tibet is when China is in question. And the question of Tibet for India has always been linked with China. You know, I'd like to say this. Tibet was an independent country at the time of our independ independence. It had its own in individual diplomatic relations with many um, countries of its own. So I'd like you to take us through a short history of the so-called India's Tibet card. Uh, Adi, uh, first of all, Tibet is a, was a country uh, because today it does not have the status of a country. It was a country uh, sovereign and independent uh, right throughout its uh, course of history till the PRC annexed it uh, in 1950s, right? Uh, but uh, the manner of its independence was always uh, varying. Uh, Prehistoric era, uh, there is not much of a record, but the record between uh, 500 BC to 6th century. Uh, was uh, existing or is existing through the Tibetan scriptures. Uh, essentially, the Yarlung dynasty was the one which uh, ruled during this period. 
uh, in the 16th 6th, 6th century uh, ad we had the uh, uh, buddhist influence from india going into tibet and that you can say was the start of tibet's uh, uh, recognition into this global world from there on started written uh, scriptures written historical records etc uh, which were uh, then created by buddhist uh, institutions which got created in tibet so i would say uh, to begin with we can we are very sure about the uh, ad part that is first ad to 6th century we did have the yarlung dynasty uh, yarlung dynasty yarlung is a river as you are aware yarlung sampo so uh, there was a there was a civilization which was existing there and slowly they captured the entire uh, tibetan uh, region including the uh, uh, western tibet northern tibet southern tibet in fact by 790 or 700 to 790 ad they say that they extended their kingdom right up to pala dynasty which is further to the south in assam and bengal which was at that period and similarly in the north they went right up to the uh, xinjiang what we call today uh, where the uyghurs etc are there and going further to kashmir and then even beyond so that was their extent of kingdom under the yarlung dynasty so therefore uh, from such a uh, height they suddenly are now without a land the tibetans today do not have an independent uh, status for their uh, existence so what happened there after was that the yarlung dynasty which was a emperor uh, 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 based rule which was existing slowly started falling apart there was a period of uh, local warlords who rose up and then they started fighting amongst themselves for primacy of lhasa or or the up towards the western tibet or towards the uh, northern tibet and the southern tibet so therefore their external influence automatically started reducing mm. i have a theory here that this all started with the advent of buddhism in tibet the first school of buddhist uh, uh, religion was started in uh, tibet which was known as the nimka school uh, now the nimka school uh, probably this is my reading that because buddhists preach a uh, peaceful coexistence and tolerance led to uh, people slowly losing their uh, desire to expand themselves and consolidate themselves and then then era of uh, regional warlords started in fact uh, there is uh, a period between 9th century to about 12th century which we can say as the era of fragmentation of tibet ah okay and uh, buddhism various schools started emerging other than the nimka school there were regional warlords with these buddhist uh, influence existing in tibet tibet got virtually split into number of uh, parts and its external influence which was earlier extending right up to south in assam and bengal or to the west in kashmir and uh, then on to afghanistan etc all that started shrinking finally around 1240 ad or so the mongolians raided the mongolians uh, started invading tibet uh, it was uh, the mongols were there for about 100 or 150 odd years and then uh, started the uh, the chinese influence but one thing good which they did was that during the qing dynasty period which was in the uh, late uh, 19th century and early 20th century up to 1912 to be very precise they invaded tibet and established their proper governor there they used to call it as ambans yes they stationed uh, 2000 to 3000 troops there everything used to then get governed through the ambans mm-hmm. and the chinese uh, uh, officials seal of approval was required on major uh, foreign and other uh, matters 
and that is the period when the uh, uh, when the any agreement with dividends signed the chinese had a rep in that in fact when the british raided in 1904 tibet through that colonel young husband uh, expedition they went into an agreement with china stating that uh, in future whatever happens they will recognize the suzerainty of tibet china over tibet not sovereignty uh, mind you suzerainty of tibet uh, china over tibet and that is the agreement they also signed with the russian yeah. lhasa because it didn't have a very strong military power it was either dependent on the mongols or the chinese to defend itself was very weak to actually or uh, put across its own uh, stand so therefore it had to willingly really agree to the fact that with any agreement which they sign the chinese rep will be there and the british kind of sealed it with this ag- agreement which they had with the russians that any future agreement which happens between uh, with, with tibet the chinese uh, rep or administrator would be there as part of the agreement so right so so the lhasa treaty this is called the lhasa treaty which happened in after the 1904 uh, invasion it was not really kind of an invasion it hardly had any uh, forces to really uh, really oppose the british at that point the Rus- the british had done this thinking that the russians would take over because the russians are ex- expanding themselves towards mongolia this is also called the first big game where the russians were quickly assimilating all the central asian republics as part of their uh, kingdom and they were then coming eastwards towards mongolia tibet and china mm. but when they when the british reached there the russians weren't really there but they still signed an agreement with, with russia that any future uh, deals with tibet chinese uh, rep would be there so uh, point which i am trying to get you is that till the time of their losing independence to prc prc remain sorry tibet remained independent it was a sovereign country suzerainty or protectorate yes of china but it was never a part of china mm. it was very clear that tibet was a independent country 10th largest country it would have been in the world if it had existed even after 1950 as big as india interesting so this is history so i feel that somewhere the loss of tibetan uh, army uh, hard power led to what it has happened today essentially over relying on tolerance and peaceful coexistence interesting so and in, in, to put this in context uh, you know india has also got protectorates for that matter it is some bhutan is something that we all know of that we 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 defend uh, the national interests on bhutan but bhutan is a sovereign independent nation one does need uh, you know uh, whatever permits to enter into bhutan so you know uh, the funny thing about this whole india tibet china game is during the 1950s when the the chinese started coming into tibet they pushed india in a corner to make sure that um, tibet is recognized as a part of china which we did without getting anything back in return the least we could have done was just you know organize our borders with the tibetans or the chinese for that matter and got an agreement sealed we didn't do that we recognized tibet and then the now we see a situation that the chinese are using tibet to attack us uh this is a weird situation and I, you know what would you like to say to something like this sir well uh there is a reason for uh, everything initially uh, china was not really that interested in uh, raising any uh, conflict with india it is only when it started looking westwards towards the karakoram highway construction of the karakoram highway that it realized the importance of aksai chain for connectivity connectivity with india okay it is at that point it realizes that if it doesn't take aksai chain then its entire 
dream of expanding towards Central Asia via Pakistan and via the Khan corridor would not be realized. Okay. Plus, they would have to move go towards that area through a very very long distance, and it would be uh, in India's advantage that we could expand ourselves right up to uh, the entire uh, bulge of Oxai chain and dominate the Chinese. It is after that realization in that that is why you will find that the 1956 line of the Chinese and the 1960 line of the Chinese there is a lot of difference. So, Chinese in any case have not honored their agreement. Like I said, the Mao statement is that every agreement is just a, just a way to buy time. Their ultimate aim is the national interest which they want to achieve. And that will never waver. If we don't realize this, I think we are uh, being uh, stupid. As simple as that. The Chinese will ultimately aim for what they are going to, uh, what they want to achieve. Which, as I said, that in 1949, uh, uh, they want to be the world's superpower. And for that, whatever they have to do, they will do. If they have to buy time through some agreements, some treaties, they will do. And it is uh, because of that exciting factor, which is the major reason for their undertaking the 1962 uh, offensive. Arunachal Pradesh came much later. It is based on what I said. Remember that initially the Tibetans' influence extended right up to our uh, Sam Bengal border. So they are trying to invoke that historical fact to claim uh, Arunachal Pradesh as South Tibet. So, uh, for example, I'll give you 1996 agreement. What was the 1996 agreement? It said that both sides will peacefully uh, resolve their boundary disputes. They will not carry arms. So they were simply buying time to ensure that their boundary remains peaceful, not settled. And utilize the loopholes in the boundary dispute to further secure their national aims and interests, which they have been doing right throughout in the last 20-25 years, if you see right from Sundarangcho to Galwan, that has been their approach. They will not resolve the boundary dispute. They will keep nibbling away at you till the time they are very sure that now they have arrived as a, as a global power and then they can actually dictate terms to you. Uh, so, in my view, we should not be surprised by what you are saying that the, why the Chinese are targeting India through Tibet. It was, it was bound to happen. It is only that we did not see it happen initially. I'm talking of 1960. Of course, yes, sir. And that, that one sees through history very, very clearly. Sir, coming to, you know, the today's scenario, um, of course, uh, you know, the Dalai Lama's history is well known. He, he's sitting in Dharamsala. He was brought in through... Arunachal Pradesh by the Indian Army under the nose of the Chinese during the invasion of Tibet. A lot has happened during history and uh, this particular thing has confounded itself into the dark pages of history where people really don't want to address it except for the few Tibetans and the few enthusiasts who are still with this story. For us to use this particular card uh, as, as a country against China, we would also need the internal the, the people that are currently living in Tibet to be uh, sympathetic one and enthusiastic about the cause of their own, uh, you know, freedom and uh, democracy and so on and so forth. There are also reports that there is hardcore harmonization of uh, that area which is taking place. When one sees both the things that I have mentioned here, sir, does it seem like a viable option for India to even think about it rather than you know, waste our resources into something that we don't we don't know the reality of. See, on the face of it, there are two major aspects uh, which we must consider before we can play this card. First of all, the Dalai Lama's position. Hmm. Dalai Lama uh, has done two very good things. One, 
that he has got all the four schools of buddhism which are there in tibet under one roof that means they all kind of now approve of the dalai lama as their overall uh, uh, head and the other schools are working together for the freedom of tibet the second thing which you must uh, consider before paying this card is that dalai lama firmly believes that we can achieve this through peaceful coexistence talks mutual understanding it is because of this that he got the nobel peace prize also that despite gravest of provocations despite the fact that he could have actually taken on a, a insurgency or a guerrilla warfare inside tibet because of his influence across as it has happened by ayatollah khomeini who did this in iran etc so there are many people who sit outside and then they foment trouble in the uh, in their parent state to gain power dalai lama refused to do so so we have to also see the dalai lama's position on this before we play the card we should not always think in my view that india is hesitant to uh, uh, to uh, play the tibet card i think unless and only until both the sides agree to play this card it is not going to succeed it's as simple as that why the bangladesh war succeeded because mujibur rahman and party succeeded to what the indian army and the indian india as a nation was trying to achieve mm-hmm. so first and foremost condition is willingness of the head of the state of tibet to actually be prepared to give the support to the why dalai lama is not giving the support is the next question which we must uh, analyze in ourselves he feels that if he indulges in this kind of a activity and knowing the fact that chinese are very very harsh on population when it comes to anybody trying to disturb their internal uh, internal peace he wants to save the lives of tibetans who are staying in tibet because any action which he takes from outside of tibet will have repercussions on the tibetans living inside it these are the three feelings i mean these are the three i think thought processes which actually lead to what the dalai is doing what dalai lama is doing uh, and why he is doing. Uh, if you look at the the current administrator of uh, of uh, tibet central uh, central tibet as it is called is sikyop sikyong sikyop is the uh, title given to him penpa sharing is the new elected uh, sikyong of uh, central uh, tibet administration who, who is in uh, Dar- uh, dharamshala actually he was in the us and then he came here and for the election so uh, even he is doing the similar lines he first wants to consolidate because he has won the elections coming outside from the country that is from basically india is considered now as the uh, government in exile central uh, mountain head so anybody who's come from outside and then won the elections and now sitting as the uh, sikyong so that is something which is uh, others may not have uh, you know taken it well so he is first trying to consolidate all the differences which are existing over his elections that's my reading then he has also said in an interview that he would like that through talks we are able to uh, uh, resolve the resolve the uh, tibet issue with china he firmly believes that in fact he gave a very interesting statement which i think somewhere tells you the psyche of people living in that region which is china and tibet what is said is time is no constraint we will wait because what goes up comes down <laughs> so if china is rising fine but china will also see its downfall it is at that point in time probably some sense will prevail there would be some agreement and if you see the history of tibet they have continuously lived with agreements now after that initial phase of yarlung dynasty where they extended their uh, kingdom to far west south east 
leaving china alone and in the north uh, they have always been agreeing uh, in agreement with mongols or with the chinese being a protectorate of chinese so therefore in my view uh, they are looking for a solution of that nature and unless they come on board playing the tibet card actively i am talking in terms of the military part of it would be difficult for us you know that is one factor i must say sir and uh, thank you for putting it pretty clearly it has not been discussed anywhere uh, you know one does read about this but it is not been discussed anywhere in the blaring media that we've got everybody is talking about why is india so silent about tibet why is india this thing why is india that thing nobody has talked about the factor that what are the connotations behind this are there any Absolutely. cultural factors there might be a small population of tibetans who would want to probably pick up arms and we know about that but of Absolutely. course the larger population as well as the spiritual or the religious leader will not do so so that creates a bit of a challenge thank you sir for putting that across sir now coming to the current scenario again uh, the chinese in reports have been you know training sort of a brigade or something like that of tibetans which are currently under occupation of china to fight against the uh, indians in high altitude um, somewhere down the line i think they they it it tells us one thing that the chinese are not confident of the han soldiers to actually take up this particular fight with the indians because of the terrains and the environment which is around i'd like to kind of uh, you know for you to break this particular down and tell us the advantages of such a thing for china and of course the disadvantages for the chinese uh, first of all i must compliment india and the indian army it is after a long time that china is aping india <laughs> that is that is something which i think we should take pride in it but on a serious note it is the hardiness of our troops whether it was in galban or whether it was in uh, uh, doklam or any other place where we have come into confrontation there have been a number of confrontation let me tell you it's not only just these two there have been virtual combat fights hand to hand almost every month in the eastern sector they are not reported in that manner but that makes them realize the strength of the indian soldier and somewhere down the line after galwan and the seeing the vagaries of the uh, terrain some sense has prevailed over them that the best people to defend would be the locals of that area <laughs> because a they don't have to actually uh, go through a uh, one go through this acclimatization and all the all other uh, things required for you to actually go there and get placed and be prepared to fight although india has now over a period of time developed a well well oiled mechanism of induction of troops or uh, training of troops in such areas and fighting in such areas our experience is far far more uh, than the chinese and also more bloodier than the chinese we have fought real wars whether it is kargil or whether it was 67 or whether it was uh, Uh, in in the galwan also i think we proved our metal because the chinese later on had to come out with their casualties by declaring their people who died as initially they were refusing to even accept that anybody has died mm. so so somewhere down the line the chinese realized that you know indian army at the tactical level or indian defense forces at the tactical level are difficult to handle so therefore they have to sort out their weak a uh, weak component of their uh, of their hard power and which was basically the terrain advantage which we have got we have utilized it so so uh, they are welcome to uh, establish this brigade but let me tell you uh, in heart of heart a tibetan is uh, is seeking his uh, independence right so unless until and unless they they start recruiting from the han base which they have created or hanaization of this area which they have created in tibet if they start drawing their uh, troops from that belt or uh, that section of population i think they will continue to retain the loyalties but if they start taking the tibetans proper tibetans who are from tibet and who owe their allegiance to the uh, dalai lama uh, then 
it their heart will not be there in the fight mm-hmm. they would like to actually not fight with the same sincerity <laughs> imagine you know you are talking of hanaization uh, the, the the chinese uh, actually uh, treated them like guinea pigs in the great leap forward which happened they deprived the entire rations of tibet and gave it to the mainland which resulted in famine and tibet was the worst affected because of it similarly uh, they started going after uh, during the cultural revolution they started going after every tibetan who had some any kind of a buddhist uh, uh, insignia with him even a photo of dalai lama uh, invited the uh, death by the uh, an chinese soldiers so that was the kind of uh, cultural uh, genocide which china did uh, during that uh, cultural revolution and even now as you said that there is uh, anization now what they are doing is they are settling the han population into this field so therefore they are trying to change the demography but until unless they get the brigade which they are raising and mind you it's just one brigade it's, i think it's a pilot project which they are trying to see whether how successful it will be uh, chinese are good uh, in training uh, their manpower i am sure they'll be a they'll be a they'll be a efficient and professionally sound troops who will be uh, facing us as part of this particular brigade till the time we are conscious of this fact i think we'll be able to take care of but if we try to ignore them that you know no, they are nothing or or you know they can be just run over i think we'll we'll do a mistake they they are very hardy fighters as i said in the past historically they have expanded their their kingdoms to as far as the uh, distances which i told to you so therefore i think we should take it seriously but at the same time it should be also taken into account that the other areas where the han army would be occupying would automatically will be that much weaker and that should give us a sense of pride that uh, the chinese on the ground are definitely going to uh, see a bloody nose if the indian army uh, decides to uh, deal with interesting so you know when we talk about playing out the tibet card one of the biggest things that actually one thinks of is psychological operations which would uh, you know probably get the results that we desire in that region because at the end of it with a history like that i'm sure they, there are a lot of people in the villages who still talk about that history the chinese can't guard their conversations you know all through the day it's not possible so i'm sure the history is well known and this can be pretty much uh, um you know established pretty hard by the fact of the videos that came out of the 100 celebration 100 year celebration of the ccp within lhasa where a lot of people were actually crying and you know uh, they were they were very unhappy with the way that the city has turned out to be a complete chinese city now as far as psychological operations is concerned sir what do you think india's options should be and what do you think that we should work on starting now because at the end of it we also need to pull a nerve somewhere or the other okay uh, as far as psychological operations are concerned it's not a it's not a one off event it's an ongoing process yes. which has to be kept at uh, and it is here that uh, we talk about gray zone war so it's not going to be only uh, through say cyber attacks it would be also through uh, through media campaigns it would also be through uh, information operation that is the social media uh, platforms the problem which i see in the psychological warfare is that how to break the digital wall of china hmm. unless we unless we intervene into the the chinese uh, social media chinese electronic media chinese print media in a manner that these psychological campaigns get visible to the people of tibet and the people of china we will not cut much ice we are only actually influencing ourselves correct you know when you see an image like this what you are saying but if it is blocked from rest of the chinese uh, population then the impact isn't there correct so somehow the first hurdle which i in my view and in fact uh, there was a cyber expert from taiwan who was giving an interview two days back to a channel who said exactly this 
now they are aware as to what the chinese are doing but now how to give it back to the chinese the first hurdle is the technological breakthrough which we have to do because before doing all this the chinese have actually isolated themselves by their own captive social uh, captive uh, media platforms mm. whether it is weibo or whether it is uh, their uh, their uh, various apps which they have whether their word even office everything you take the microsoft office they don't use microsoft office. so they have actually virtually isolated themselves india has been trying to do it but we again like you know like good indians we fall back to the easiest option we make a platform on the linux but nobody uses linux so we all go to microsoft windows microsoft windows is exposed to the world anybody can hack onto your system and then be done with it so therefore uh, culturally and uh, uh, technically they have made themselves very secure i i feel that in the uh, earlier centuries they had made the physical wall now they have made the digital wall for their safety so first and foremost break the break the digital digital wall and then human intelligence is something which we have to really work despite the fact that what the lai lama's position is and what the sikyong of uh, the central administration of tibet is doing we can find resources which can be inducted into tibet and then they start this process of uh, word to mouth you know uh, uh campaigns actually hitting out at the uh, chinese atrocity this and then then slowly tweeting in their own world problem is if they tweet in vibo they get caught and then they are dealt with very severely so uh, my sense is that china has to be globally defamed once the chinese image is brought down automatically the tibetans will get that space where then we can push in our psychological agenda psychological psychological campaign into tibet and then so first and foremost is we have to deal with china as as the power bring them down and for that our comprehensive national power also has to increase we have to buy time through treaties and agreements and then continuously strengthen ourselves but gray zone we must continue why can't we hire uh, or why can't we employ hackers to hack into the chinese system i know it is difficult but we can always find a way out if we try the indians are also quite intelligent to uh, to actually do i mean so many things if a, if an odd uh, if an odd person one person sitting in the us i don't want to name him during the dalit revolution within a day mobilized the entire human sea of humanity of dalits on 2nd of april 2018 is what i am talking about and there was anti government uh, agitation spreading across the entire country just 100 of them he and along with his 100 other uh, associates he managed to do this within i think 4 to 5 hours this entire streets of india were filled with uh, dalits agitating against that in 2018 in uh, i think second april hmm. so we we do have uh, people maske was his name from the, uh, the guy who actually did this so i'm sure we as indians have the capability we only need to be prodded we are not actually i think uh, uh, fully into this gray zone yeah. we are still hesitant mm. we have to smartly deal with china we can't deal with him in hard power i think we are being stupid to deal with him in hard power as of today given the differential which we have we have to deal with him in the gray zone that's the only way to bring down china in the near near term in the long term yes by all means go ahead Bec- i mean once you become uh, import independent yeah in your defense till then and I'm, i'm sorry we will not be able to achieve the supremacy which we are looking at as far as the hard power is concerned deterrence yes but supremacy no i agree with you sir absolutely and that is something that uh, all of us must yeah. understand uh, 
I secondly, with regards to what you said about how to reach Tibet, I mean, India does get very innovative when it wants to. Uh, there were reports about playing the Tibetan national anthem at the Pengong so when they were playing Punjabi Bhangra music. I'm sure the message reached back pretty loud and clear that, you know, let's not cross this line because there will be repercussions. So when push Absolutely. comes to shove, we do stuff. But the problem and the reason that I thought that we would talk about is that, and this is something that I mentioned in the uh, introduction as well, is let's not come to that point where somebody is pushing us and then we are trying to do something. All these options must be ready with us. So my last question to you, and you were talking about you know asymmetry when we are talking about psychological op operations. We are talking about gray zone warfare. Uh, currently, we only see it happening to us. Even if there is something happening back, we don't get to know because at the end of it, in India, the reporting of this kind of things are pretty poor and the Chinese don't talk about it. So for us to even come to know if there is any operations being taken, taken up, it's very next to impossible. But let me ask you this, sir. You know, with, with what all we've gone through in the past year against the Chinese and of course a lot more before that as well, when we start playing the Tibet card, and I say this, why? Because the Prime Minister for the first time has wished him on his uh, birthday. After that, there was a, uh, a new snippet that came out with the Dalai Lama wants to come and meet the Prime Minister on the Tibetan issue. So there is a lot suddenly which has moved up. So when we are now getting ready to play the card in whatever way that we decide to, there will be repercussions back to us. My question is, uh, are we ready for this? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, mostly you will find that we are reactive in our approach. Yeah. Whether it was the <clears throat> Jammu drone attack, we all knew that this is a threat which is now uh, becoming more and more real. We all went in for securing drones, etc. Similar is the story on the Chinese front. We uh, we always are aware that the you know there would be a next incursion or next transgression somewhere along the uh, line of control, line of actual control. But somehow, uh, over a period of time, we tend to get relaxed and then the political uh, agenda starts and then the talk starts. So everybody becomes a, you know, goes on to a, a low drive. And at the end of the day, we get served. My uh, approach to China would be now, in terms of long term, is that uh, A, we should now consider China as an enemy. Hmm. We, as the Indian Defense Forces, cannot rest under this premise that, okay, now the government is not mentioning China directly, government is not, uh, uh, you know, raising the Chinese name as far as one China policy is concerned or Hong Kong is concerned or, for that matter, position on Taiwan is concerned. As Indian Defense Forces... We have to treat China the way we treat Pakistan. Correct. That's point number one. Mm. That means your alertness levels have to be the highest. We may not be strong, but we need to be from the surveillance, ISR point of view, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance has to be of the highest order. For that, we need to do as much procurement as possible because early warning will always prevent anything like what has happened in Doklam or Galwan from happening. Mm. That's the first way to deal with this asymmetry which is there between India and China as far as the hard power is concerned. The second thing is, uh, the example which you quoted of, you know, uh, when they were playing Bhangra, it's not a new thing, you know, it is happening. If you see 1962, they used to say Hindi, Chini, Bhai, Bhai, and, that, uh, and similar kind of things they have been doing in the eastern sector also. And we also uh, back it up by raising the Tibetan issue. But... Mm, Mind you, all this is happening at the ground level, at the brigade level, at the core level. It is the initiative of these guys who actually, they don't go and ask anyone that I am now going to play the Tibetan national anthem. They will play it because it's a provocation which is taking place on the ground. Yeah, mm -hmm. it got reported in the media now. That's a, a different uh, ball game. What we need to do is that gray zone as a policy now has to come into it. I think that is the smartest way to deal with asymmetry. How has Pakistan held us to ransom till date? 
if you look at the superiority part of it we are compre- our comprehensive national power is far ahead of pakistan but they have managed to balance between the americans the chinese us to deal with india and now you they are even managing the russians and we are now waking up to the russians i'll tell you a very simple in july the indian government rushed to approve a proposal to acquire 33 new russian war planes for us dollar 2.4 billion why in july when galwan happens then you go and rush to the russians and upgrade 59 more in addition to an earlier us dollar 5.43 billion deal for s400 air defense uh, missile systems why don't you start let's put our best foot forward start negotiating for s500 we dump the s400 my point is that my point is that we invest in selectively game changing capabilities drones have drones can be effective against us by china if you see the ranges of chinese drones you will be you will be so surprised that you know sitting in uh, tibet he can hit anywhere in our country with drones wow oh. so therefore why can't we go in for a counter drone system which is of the uh, state of the art now ideal is indigenously procure it unless we unless we drive the scientific community i mean the political leadership should drive the scientific community it should not be treating it with uh, soft batons it should be given a target look if the same indians can do what they are doing in nasa why can't you do it why can't we pay out to the scientists in nasa which are indians get them here and make them to do the uh, you pay them more than what they are getting in nasa it is better than importing a stuff for which you are totally dependent on which can be choked any time in the future i think somewhere we have to now get focused okay smart technologies is the way ahead and anybody anywhere who is working in the best format just buy him out get him to india and make him in charge of the place that's the way we can deal with this asymmetry smart weapon system development and for that no soft peddling the leadership has to now hard push these developments under the personal directions of the ministry of defense or the chief of defense staff is his task must be clearly cut out you will be doing this this on priority leave aside the others i let me tell you tanks and guns are not going to make a major difference in our results correct especially with the chinese given the uh, given the terrain the way it is so we need technologies which are going to be effective in such a terrain focus on those we need the pinagas go for pinagas why only 10 regiments when something will happen and you find that it is not there in the eastern sector now you are moving it all the way from west to east i can put you examples where we had to move a system from west to east during the doklam crisis and our trains were incapable of taking air attack so many problems i had to that's called reactive mm. response so i think we need to gear up our systems identify our priorities go for selectively smart technologies which will make an impact on the chinese borders that's the only way to get their symmetry i don't want to mention weapon system everybody knows these weapon systems etc and the, and the uh, like i said isr system which, which will help us in uh, getting to know what the chinese are up to well in advance the intelligence agencies must be driven now enough is enough please focus on to the the chinese how many chinese language schools are there how many universities are actually dealing with the chinese language none very few now there are some some uh, people you know like rru they have started doing something in on the chinese language otherwise we were dependent on good old jnu jawarlal nehru university ke 
they used to produce and there is a university in uh, bengal which is the the uh, rabindranath tagore two two university that some uh, sprinkling of small schools here and there is not going to address a problem of a adversary who is your number one adversary at those don't understand what is there in front of them even if you get the intelligence you are not able to decipher it then it goes to somewhere it gets translated then it comes back for a flag meeting we do not get uh, interpreters they all come from delhi i think we need to focus where like i said smart focus is what we have to do asymmetry will get over because of uh, by doing all these things. interesting sir i think you mentioned not that the... if, sorry not that we are not doing it but we are not doing it with a sense of purpose that's yes. yeah that's the thing no i think you mentioned the same thing about uh, playing the tibet card as well technology technology and technology and i think that's the way forward with india because at the end of it uh, where the chinese are ahead today is that they don't have the kind of uh, manpower that we do they don't have the kind of advantages in terms of our ethos and values as we do they don't have the stability within their areas to even back them up but they're still ahead of the game because of simple technology that is something i think we all need to understand they've been able to penetrate systems uh i think me and general dushant have spoken about gray zone warfare pretty much every time we've spoken yeah. and that is something which is going to be the future sir just to conclude this uh, the general took us across uh, you know in a very brief way but a very concise way the history of uh, tibet how they are in a place where they're not able to actually properly unite as a nation and fight um it's about in toler- it's about tolerance it's about coexistence it's about whole other peaceful things where there's nothing wrong in that but in in an idealistic world but in today's world where your enemy is china well uh, you know when rule books don't count uh, i guess it, it's time that we as uh, neighbors of tibet start looking at this differently i do appreciate the fact that there was a tweet sent out by the prime minister and this and that but you know that isn't enough uh, the, it is high time that we also start playing a game because at the end of it if we don't stand up to our own game the chinese are never going to back off so thank you sir for this lovely discussion on tibet um it is a hot topic it is going to remain so for a while because the us is also propagating it a lot of the european countries are also talking about it india has started talking about it finally and so let's see let's wait and watch and i uh, you know request you to keep your radars on towards tibet so that we can actually do a sequel to this discussion if there are if and when there are any developments on this issue till then sir thank you and jai hind thank you thank you very much